Good evening, everybody. My name is Dolores O'Riordan. I'm the director of UCD's Institute of Food and Health. I'm delighted that you can join us for this evening's public talk, which is on nutrition and sports performance. The concept of these public lectures is to help you listen to the experts in the field and ensure you have the scientific evidence that will underpin all aspects of nutrition and health. And as I say tonight, we're going to focus on sports performance. Our lecturer this, this evening is Dr. Haiti Corner, Horner, and she's a lecturer in sport and exercise science in UCD. She completed her BSc and MSc in the University of Limerick in the area of sports and exercise, and then conducted a PhD in exercise and nutrition in Australia. So her research is focusing on exercise physiology and nutrition to optimize health and performance. She's also a registered nutritionist in the area of sports and exercise and works as part of the Ad Astra Academy athlete support team at UCD. So this evening's talk will begin with Katie presenting some material to you, but a very important element of the public health series is to provide you with the opportunity to ask some questions and hear the answers from the experts. So I'm also delighted to welcome this evening Dr. Lachlan Mitchell, and he's a dietitian and exercise scientist who is the current manager of the National Nutrition Surveillance Centre at UCD. The focus of his research is in nutrition and exercise and covering a range of topics including childhood obesity, sports performance and nutrition. He completed his PhD at the University of Sydney and looked at the physiology, body composition and the body image of natural bodybuilders. So he has a lot of experience in practice, working as an accredited practicing dietitian and exercise scientist in Ireland, Australia, and indeed in Canada. So I'm delighted to have Lachlan on board as well, who, as I say, will answer the questions. You can pose your questions in the chat function, but we won't go to any of the questions and answers until Katie has finished her presentation. So over to you, Katie, to begin. Hi everyone, so thank you very much Dolores for the introduction and thank you very much to everyone for joining the webinar this evening. So the focus of this public talk is on the topic of nutrition and sports performance. So it's a pretty broad topic and these are some of the aspects that I'll focus on. So on daily guidelines, nutrition around exercise, immune function and supplements. These talks are targeted at the general public, so I hope to be able to introduce to you some of the scientific evidence, as well as practical information of how you may be able to implement nutrition in practice to improve performance. So why is nutrition important? These are just some aspects of, sport, of sports nutrition that can aid performance. So it can help to gain the most out of your training, it can enhance recovery, delay fatigue during exercise, improve brain function and decision making during exercise, enhance body composition, reduce risk of injury and illness, and help with achieving high level performances on a regular basis. So along with natural talent and training, nutrition can really have quite a big impact on performance. So what is best for sports performance? It's a hugely confusing area from what we can see in the media. We've athletes promoting specific diets, magazines along with sports websites and blogs and social media often giving us quite mixed messages. And as a result, these are some of the common questions that might be asked by athletes. These were compiled by two leading researchers and practitioners in sports nutrition based on questions they were most commonly faced with from athletes. So things like, is it true I don't need high carbohydrates anymore? Is a high fat diet not the best approach? What should I eat when I'm injured or should I take such and such a supplement? And this was their conclusion that there's likely never a definitive right or wrong answer ultimately let, we're left with the task of interpreting the available scientific literature to formulate strategies that best suit the individual. 
And this we believe is the true art of sports nutrition. So firstly, considering the first aspect here of interpreting the scientific literature, how do we do this in sports nutrition? For anyone who's been to the previous public lectures, this figure here is often shown at the beginning. So the lowest quality evidence is anecdotal evidence. So something someone says. Then we move up to observational studies and then randomized controlled trials. And then above that again, we have systematic reviews and meta-analyses which combine results from several studies. And in sports nutrition, what we have is some excellent expert position statements from scientists in the field who compile recommendations based on the most up-to-date evidence available. These are two examples here. The position stand from the American College of Sports Medicine and the UEFA expert group statement on nutrition in elite football published just a few weeks ago, which I'll be referencing in this talk and well worth a look at if you're interested. So where do we start? How do we interpret the evidence in this area and consider what's most important for performance? And this is the way that some people might think when they first think, when they think of sports nutrition. So the first thing that might come to mind is what supplements can I take? Then what food I eat before and after training? And then the last thing is what am I eating in my regular diet? But it should actually be the other way around. And this is the evidence-based approach here to optimize nutrition for performance. So far greater improvements will be made by getting your daily diet right and then your sports nutrition, so your food intake around exercise. This is where the biggest gains in health and performance can be made. If you don't get the fundamentals right, there's no point in going near supplements. So I'm going to talk through some of the evidence as well as practical recommendations relating to each of these stages in the pyramid now. So firstly, considering the base of the pyramid focused on balanced diet, the number one thing to consider before you look at anything else is to make sure that you're consuming enough energy to match your lifestyle. High quality reviews of the evidence have shown that if you're in a state, a chronic state of energy deficiency, where your intake is much lower than your expenditure, this can, among other effects, negatively impact on hormones, on immune function, on bone health, increased risk of injury, and even impair performance. So you can have the best diet in the world, but if you're not eating enough on a regular basis, it will be difficult to perform at your peak. So meeting energy requirements is the number one aspect to first look at for optimal performance. The next aspect to consider is within that energy, which source is it best derived from? So here we're considering our macronutrients. So how much energy should come from our carbohydrates, our grains, cereals, breads, proteins, our lean meats, fish, eggs, and fat, so things like avocados and nuts. So firstly, looking at carbohydrates, these can often get a bad name in nutrition, but they really are a fundamental part of an athlete's diet. And this is why. They're essential for brain function. We know that glucose is the preferred fuel source for the brain. They're also stored in the muscle as glycogen, which is essential to fuel high intensity exercise. So when our muscles become depleted of glycogen, we can't maintain high intensity exercise. Also, if we're chronically training in a state of low carbohydrate availability, this can compromise our immune function. And finally, in contrast to fat and protein, which we can store large quantities of the body, of in the body, we can only store a very limited amount of carbohydrate, so about 2000 calories in the average person. And we use up these stores during high intensity exercise. So it's essential that we replace this through the diet. So does this mean that we should have a high carbohydrate intake every day? Well, this is something that guidelines have evolved quite a lot on over the years. We can see this if we look at the consensus statements from the International Olympic Committee or the IOC, which have produced expert statements on the topic. In 1991, it was recommended that 60 to 70% 
of the daily diet should be carbohydrate. So a high carbohydrate diet every day. A few changes were made then in 2003, and then the recommendations were changed quite substantially in their 2010 statement, which are the guidelines we still use today. And these state that an athlete's carbohydrate intake should be dynamic rather than static. Each session has different requirements, and as a result, carbohydrate intake should be periodized. And these were the guidelines produced, which as I said, we use today, with recommendations for carbohydrate intake based on grams per kilogram of body mass for the athlete. So for example, is if the recommendation is eight grams per kilogram of body mass per day, you multiply eight by your body mass and that gives you the total amount of carbohydrate you should be aiming for in the day. So in this case for the 70 kilo athlete, that would be 560 grams over the course of the day. And you can see here how the recommendations vary based on the activity undertaken in the day. So on a light activity day, this could be a rest day or a day with low intensity exercise, the recommended range for intake is quite low. Whereas when we get up to high or very high activity, that recommended intake is nearly double. So these recommendations have been summarized by the phrase fuel for the work required, that we should adjust our carbohydrate intake based on the demands of the day. So there's a lot of numbers in the previous slide which are useful, but if we look at this in simpler terms, this is what it looks like. So these are examples of what an athlete's plate should look like on two different types of training day. On the left for a moderate training day, so you can see your grains, your carbohydrates, your protein and your vegetables. And on the right, on a hard training day, so more of the plate taken up by grains. So the key message is to increase the amount of carbs on your plate on hard training days. So what about protein intake as an athlete? We know that protein is important for athletes for growth and repair. And similar to carbohydrate guidelines, current protein guidelines are also expressed relative to your own body mass. And the range of 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram of body mass per day is rec recommended as optimal for most athletes which would equate to about 84 to 140 grams per day for a 70 kilo athlete. And although many people often think that, and it's often driven in the media as well, that the more protein, the better, this doesn't seem to be the case. And this was shown in this meta-analysis, which combined results from several studies that examined how daily protein intake during resistance training related to gains in fat-free mass or lean mass. And you can see here that this breakpoint occurred at a daily intake of about 1.6 grams per kilogram of body mass per day. So up to this point, more protein meant a greater gain in lean mass, but there was no further benefit of going above 1.6 grams per kilo per day. So there may be some advantages in going higher if someone is restricting energy to lose weight, or if they're injured. But for most people, this recommended range here should be optimal and there's no need to go above this. So again, lots of numbers, but what does this look like in practice? In general, it's recommended in the guidelines that we try and spread our protein intake evenly during the day. And this is why. So our bodies are constantly in this process of muscle protein synthesis shown in green and breakdown in red. So when we're in the fasted state, when we wake up in the morning, we're in the red here in breakdown. But then we have a meal containing protein and gradually go back into synthesis, so muscle growth. Then we go into the post-absorptive state a few hours after a meal and go back into breakdown. So this process continues throughout the day. So if we're looking to grow muscle, what we want to do is shift uh, th these up upwards towards these dashed lines. So increase synthesis shown in green and reduce breakdown shown in red. To do this, you need to do 
and this will mean that we're in a positive protein balance and that muscle can be gained. But to do this, you need to do resistance exercise and you also need to optimize your protein intake. For most people, this will average out at consuming a meal containing about 20 to 30 grams of protein every three to five hours, and that will result in hitting daily targets as well. So this could be something like having 500 mils of milk at breakfast alongside a handful of nuts, three eggs scrambled egg at lunch, chicken breast at dinner and uh, Greek yogurt before bed. Finally, in terms of macronutrients, it's also important that we don't neglect fat, even though it's often thought of negatively. It's an essential part of the diet and it does have a role in sports performance as it can assist with brain function, absorption of vitamins and in reducing inflammation. In general, recommendations for fat intake in athletes are in line with public health guidelines and state that it should comprise by 20 to 35 percent of daily intake. These are all good sources of fat for an athlete's diet. Whereas saturated fat coming from things like cakes, biscuits, butter, etc., should be limit, limited to less than 10% of daily intake. So, those are our macronutrients. There's also some micronutrients that are particularly important for athletes, and these are key ones here. So, optimum vitamin D status has been associated with injury prevention, improved rehabilitation, reduced inflammation, reduced risk of stress fractures, and reduced risk of illness. We also have um, calcium, which has various functions in athletes and can be got through including dairy in the diet and green leafy veg. And finally, iron. Iron deficiency and anemia can be quite common in athletes, particularly females. It's associated with fatigue and shown to impair performance. So it's important to have this tested as an athlete, even once a year, it can be done as part of a regular blood test. There's also a whole host of other vitamins and minerals that are important to include in your diet. And a lot of these can be got through fruit and veg intake. It's important to try and have a variety. So as all of the different colors of fruit and veg have different properties as shown here, which can relate to athlete health. So the key message that you might have heard of is eat the rainbow, which means to try and eat a variety of colours of fruit and veg during the day. Another final aspect of a balanced diet that's important for athletic performance is to ensure that you're optimally hydrated. When you're in a water deficit of more than 2% of body mass, many studies have shown that endurance performance is impaired. And some studies have also shown strength and power to be impaired in some athletes. And these are the mechanisms shown here. So it can reduce your blood volume, it can increase thirst and reduce mood. And this in turn can negatively impact on cardiovascular function, increase body temperature, fasten the rate of glycogen depletion and increase your perceived exertion. And all of this will lead to impaired performance. So a simple way of checking if you're hydrated on a daily basis is to look looking at your urine colour. It should be a pale yellow, as you can see here. If it's not, this indicates that you're not drinking enough. And combining this with monitoring your morning body weight can be a very useful way of monitoring your hydration status. So these are some of the key elements of a balanced diet for athletic performance. And it may sound boring, but this is what should be implemented as much as possible on a daily basis. If we look at this in practice, this is an example from a couple of years ago from a study that documented the daily intake of several Liverpool first team players. And here you can see their daily options for breakfast, for lunch and dinner. So including their protein, their carbohydrate, and two vegetables and snacks. So as I said, this forms the base of the pyramid and getting into a habit of this and getting daily diet right can have one of the biggest impacts on sports performance. So to summarize this part of the pyramid, the base, firstly, it's essential to sure, ensure that you're getting enough energy to match your requirements. 
Then to consider your macronutrients, your carbohydrate, protein, and fat, your micronutrients, and to ensure you're optimally hydrated. All of this will contribute to peak performance. So once you've got this right, the next step of the pyramid is to look at sports nutrition. And as I said, this refers to the amount, composition and timing of food intake around exercise. And this can serve various functions. It can help to reduce fatigue during exercise, can enhance adaptations to training. It can have a psychological effect in making people feel good in what they're eating before exercise. It can help with recovery and serve a basic function of preventing hunger. But one of the major goals in relation to performance, as I said, is to reduce fatigue during exercise, as this will enhance chances of winning. However, when we're thinking about the most appropriate sports nutrition strategy, it's essential that we consider the individual needs and demands of our own sport. And I've pulled out two examples here to highlight this point. So if we consider events that cause fatigue within one to 10 minutes, this could be an event like 1500 meter running or many rowing events. We know that in these events, due to high rates of anaerobic glycolysis producing energy, that the muscle becomes acidic. And here you can see the drop in pH that occurs in the muscle during high intensity exercise. This is termed muscle or metabolic acidosis, and it's considered the primary cause of fatigue in this type of event. So the nutritional strategy to try and reduce this is basically anything that can reduce the acidity of the muscle. And that's where nutritional strategies like sodium bicarbonate or beta alanine supplementation can have a role in these type of events. Whereas if we look at more prolonged events, this could be running a marathon or many different team sports. We know that the depletion of our carbohydrate stores, so our glycogen in the muscle is the major source of fatigue. So knowing this, we can optimize our glycogen stores through strategies such as carbohydrate loading and taking in carbohydrate before and during the event. So the nutritional strategy to improve performance really needs to take, in, take into account the demands of the specific event. I have a few examples here now to illustrate just how big an impact getting nutrition right can have on performance. So if we know that muscle glycogen is likely to be a cause of fatigue, then we should consider carbohydrate loading. And this is why. This was a study undertaken on cyclists in the 90s. On one occasion, they followed a low carbohydrate diet where they were in a depleted state. And on another occasion, they followed a high carbohydrate diet called the loaded state. So you can see here that when they were in the loaded state, the amount of glycogen stored in the, their muscle before and after exercise was much higher than when they were in the depleted state. They then undertook a two hour exercise test on a bike. And you can see here the corresponding impact that this had on performance. So in the depleted state shown in red, their intensity of exercise dropped right from the very beginning and continued to drop throughout the two hours of the exercise test. Whereas in the loaded state, they were able to maintain that same exercise intensity throughout. So being in a depleted state was concluded to reduce exercise capacity by about 50%. But it's important to note that this required a high carbohydrate diet for 24 to 48 hours before the event. So it's not just a big meal the morning of a game or the night before, it requires increasing your carbohydrate intake for at least one day beforehand. And for anyone interested in team sports, similar effects have also been shown here. Individuals with higher muscle glycogen levels before a game were found to cover more distance in both halves of the game, spend less time walking, and to complete nine more sprints in a match compared to those that started the game with low glycogen levels. So carbohydrate loading can have a big impact on performance and is important to consider to optimize in sports where muscle glycogen is a cause of fatigue. So carbohydrate loading refers to increasing intake over the day or two before an event. But what about eating in the immediate hours before training or competition? 
In terms of what a meal before exercise should contain, these are the recommendations here from the American College of Sports Medicine. But basically a carbohydrate based meal about three hours before should be sufficient and tolerable for most. So these are examples of high carbohydrate meals here that are also low in fiber and low in fat as this will reduce the likelihood of any digestive issues during the event. In terms of during exercise, what you should take in really depends on the nature of the exercise. If it's prolonged high intensity exercise, then taking in carbohydrate during the event may be useful. This study here compared the effects of consuming nothing versus water or a carbohydrate drink during exercise on how long it would take for cyclists to reach exhaustion. And you can see here that water kept them going for longer than nothing, but the carbohydrate drink kept them going for longer again. So they were able to cycle for just over 30 minutes longer having had the carbohydrate drink compared to nothing. But again, it's important to note that these were trained athletes completing high intensity prolonged exercise. So the context is really important to consider. If it's short duration exercise, less than 45 minutes, the guidelines are that no carbohydrate is needed. We don't need to consume anything. If it's between 45 and 75 minutes, small amounts may be beneficial. If it's one to two hours, about 30, 30 grams per hour. And if two to three hours, guidelines are for about 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. And things like bananas, sports drinks or gels can all be good options. But the level of the athlete needs to be considered as well as the training goals when you're considering what's best. In terms of after exercise, generally aiming for protein combined with carbohydrate is best. And these are some examples of good options for recovery here. So something simple like milk and bananas is excellent. Carbohydrate in particular is important to have soon after exercise if you've just completed a high intensity session, as this is when our muscles are able to replenish glycogen at the fastest rate. So you can see here the rate at which we, we replenish glycogen is much higher in the first hour after exercise compared to when it's delayed. So this is key for quick recovery or when you're in a period of condensed competition, as in general, it takes about 24 hours to fully, for the muscle to fully recover our muscle glycogen stores. The final part of the pyramid is supplements, and they do have a role in sports performance, but are really mainly relevant, as I said, when other aspects have been addressed. So these are some supplements that have been proven to have benefits in specific contexts. For example, caffeine consumed during endurance exercise may enhance cycling time trial performance. And before exercise has been shown to improve performance in anaerobic activities. Creatine has been shown to improve aspects of strength with most benefits appearing with most pronounced effects in events that last less than 20 seconds. And sodium bicarbonate has been shown to benefit short term high intensity exercise. So it's really important to highlight the underlined part here that the proven benefits are in specific contexts. So you really need to consider how relevant that supplement is to your own event. Another key aspect to consider when considering supplements is to ensure that they aren't contaminated. And one way to ensure the quality of the supplement is to look for this informed sport logo here. So this indicates that the supplements have been tested by an independent lab to the company. There are companies that do this for most of their products. So this is really important to look at. There's a list here of supplements that may have benefits in specific contexts. But if you're considering supplementation, consulting with a dietitian, a dietitian or a nutritionist would be useful to ensure that they are of benefit to you. Because of the times we're living in and approaching winter, I want to draw attention to immune function in athletes as well. So this figure here shows how the risk of illness relates to training load in both recreational and elite athletes. So basically what you see here is that at a moderate training load, that illness risk is low. 
but when undertaking a high training load, that risk of illness can be increased quite substantially. So this is something to be aware of if you're undertaking a large amount of training. But there are things you can do. You can help your immune system by ensuring you're consuming a balanced diet. So you're consuming enough energy, carbohydrates and a variety of fruit and veg intake. There's also some evidence that taking a probiotic daily can help with immune function. Ensuring that your vitamin D status is optimal is also important. And as we should all be familiar with now, washing hands and in some cases using an alcohol hand gel is very important as well, as is sleep. So aiming for a minimum of seven hours sleep a night. So all, doing all of these things should help to assist our immune systems. Finally, just to finish up, I want to come back to the important point here on considering nutrition strategies that best suit the individual. I've highlighted this a little already, but this is essential to consider. The fuel that you put into your body can be thought of just like how you'd fuel a car. And we have electric cars now to add to the mix these days. So if you don't put in the right fuel, you won't perform to your optimum. All athletes are different between and within sports. So it's very important to consider individual needs as we saw previously with the example of what causes fatigue. And these are some of the individual factors here to consider. So what are your goals? Are they long-term or short-term? Do they relate to performance or body composition? The, the specific demands of the sport, and this will relate to the intensity and the duration of the sport. The energy needs of the athlete, so what are, what are your calorie requirements? How big a factor will, or how big a role will environment have? Will the event or training be in the heat or the cold, for example? How relevant are solids and liquids? How important is nutrient timing, so what you eat before, during and after exercise relative to your event? And last but not least, considering food preferences. If the person or you don't like the food, then it's going to be very difficult to consume on a regular basis and particularly around exercise. So the recommendations refer to a lot of numbers. So if you're interested in putting the exact recommendations into practice, one method is to keep a food diary. There's lots of free apps that allow you to do this, such as MyFitnessPal and others, and they allow you to enter your daily intake. And then you can see for yourself how close you are to meeting, for example, your calorie and carbohydrate requirements. Even doing this for a few days can give you an indication of what you might need to adjust. If you don't like this, another method is to go by the athlete plates. So using simple guides like this to adjust the rough quantities of different foods on your plate, depending on the amount of training that you're doing. Alternatively, poor recovery, lack of energy or weight loss could all be signs that you're not consuming enough energy or carbohydrate to support your training and that you may need to increase these. Another practical aspect to consider that can be especially useful for athletes is preparation. It can be extremely hard to make decisions on the go or when tired after training or matches. So planning out meals in advance and having a good supply of snacks available can be especially useful when trying to ensure you meet your nutrition goals. So in summary, to perform at your peak, it's important to consider these three aspects here. And firstly, to ensure that you're eating enough, that you're getting enough carbohydrates. So try and vary your intake based on the demands of the day. This is important to fuel both the brain and the muscle. Spread your protein throughout the day to aid in repair and recovery and adaptation. So try to ensure a good protein source at each meal. Include plenty of fruit and veg. This will help in preventing illness. And hydrate so that you can train at your best. In terms of your intake around exercise, try and ensure you're fueled beforehand. Have something during the event only if it's needed and ensure you recover after. And finally, to ensure that you're prepared in advance when possible. So these are some useful resources here, which I feel may be particularly useful for anyone interested in learning more. For a summary of the scientific evidence base, these are two key journal articles. 
these are some booklets here available freely on the internet, which are give a fantastic overview with various resources on sports nutrition. And this website here is also um, a really nice one, which gives insights into science and also practical aspects as well. So thank you very much for joining this evening. I hope you got something out of it and we're very happy to take any questions that you might have.